police demanded uh, that they disclose their sources of information. Yes. Yes, police demanded that they disclose their source of information. In fact, um, that was quite a routine for them. Um, oftentimes when they, um, when you publish something that they don't like, even if it is corruption, rather than investigating what happened, so they will tell you to tell them who the source of that information. But isn't it a cardinal principle that uh, that that is privileged information or confidential information that should not and cannot be disclosed? Well, yeah, in journalism, the ethics are very clear. You rather die or go to jail than disclose the source of your confidential information. And that was not to be recognized by the NIA or the Gambia police at the time of jamming? No. Let's see. Uh, let's move on to 13 June 1996 and Sumana Baji of the point and arrested at Soma for criticizing the AFPRC? Yeah, I mean, um, Jame, um, you know, by constitution was required to have a countrywide tour every, twice every year. And we do know that these, you know, tours are meant to um, familiarize himself with what is happening in the country, in particular with respect to the farming community. It was a practice that was, um, that he inherited from the Jara um, used government. used to be meet the farmer's store. Meet the farmer's store, yeah. Okay, tell us about it. Continue. Yeah, so, yeah, it was a practice that he in inherited from the Jame, from the Jara government. But we do know that these stores are um, politicized because most times, um, you know, they will be talking about political issues and not about the situation that the farmers were facing. So this particular reporter wrote a story about the politicization of the tour and for which he got arrested and detained. Alaji Yoro Jalo again of the Independent. I must tip my heart for him. He, he must, he, he's, he's been arrested too many times. And this one was in 1997. Alaji Yorajalo and Aliu Badara Sow, and they were arrested and detained for a week for publishing stories of a riot at the prison. Is this the same arrest as Ernest? Yes. Ibrahim Ernest? Yes. In which he was deported? Yes. So you also don't criticize or say things about the prison? Is that right? Well, uh, well, yes. I mean, you don't. It, it was very unpredictable as to what the regime would like or not like. And then Mohammed Ellicott Said, the Ghanaian journalist with a Gambian wife, he yes. too was arrested and deported. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Citizen FM, of course, Babukar Gay and and Ibrahim Asila. Yes, they were also arrested. Mm -hmm. And Babu Karge charged under the Telegraph Act. Yes. Convicted, fined for three hundred dollars. Yes. And the conviction was subsequently overturned. Yes. Right? Yes. So twenty six April nineteen ninety eight, Daily Observer. This was a raid at the Daily Observer, right? Yes. And what happened there? Well they um raided the offices and then um, they arrested about five technical staff there. I mean, this was uh, early hours, and it was the production team that was mainly there. There were about five Gambians and two Senegalese who were there. So they arrested them and they released them. 9 June 1998, Sule Musa, the guy who was deported for celebrating the death of Abacha. Yes. Interesting. Then 30 August 1998, Tia Felix George, uh, Andem Bajao of the Daily Observer. Uh, I think they were arrested, according to your dispatch, for publishing an article about uh, a wall that, has colla that had collapsed at State House due to rainfall or something. And they get arrested for that too? Yes, in fact, the reporter also got arrested. That's the subsequent one. Geran Senghor was Sengor. arrested. And Demba Jao and Teofilis George were also arrested 
for that just for question. writing that a wall had collapsed at state house well yeah they thought that was some sensitive um story so okay uh lamin nb Daffe, uh, um, the reporter who went to the police station to ask questions about uh, arrest of dis differently abled non-gambians yeah i mean i think to put context to this particular one um there was a time when um um i think jami himself made some public statements about this about the fact that you have a lot of non-gambians in the country who are differently abled and they are the ones who beg in the streets and at some point they were rounded up these beggars and sending them away uh, this reporter was inquiring about that particular incident and he got arrested for it and again alaji yoro jalo and baba gale jalo this one first august 1999 i'm sorry baba we can't have you to come and testify so just sit there and nod <laughs> please <laughs> please go ahead yes alaji and baba i mean this was when the independent was first ordered to um, cease operations because they didn't regularize their status with the commissioner for income tax and this is the first time i have ever heard that a government would refuse to collect tax that a person wants to pay yes but uh, <laughs> interesting uh, then sirif bojang uh, editor-in-chief of the observer and alu badara so um, and uh, and this was in september 1999 and they were taken to the nia regarding the helicopter that that came to Kanilai. You remember that, uh, that publication? He, yes, Ali Badara actually was the reporter um, in this instance, and Serif was the editor. Yes, so they reported that a helicopter, Senegalese helicopter, had circled the um, native village of President Jame, and then there were some gun shots, and then they got arrested for it. Yeah. Were they eventually charged? Were they eventually charged with no, any crime? No, they were never. In fact, in a lot of these cases, um, I didn't have enough time to actually um, look at that quite well. But then I estimated that in a lot of these cases, more than half of them, they were not even charged at all. More than half of the 140 plus incidents of arrest and detention, they were not charged. Interesting. Mohamed Mboyo, we've dealt with his case. That's yeah. the Congolese who was deported to Nigeria. Yes. Even though they knew that he was from the DRC. Yes. Okay. Uh, Madi MKC say he too must have been arrested more than once. Uh, he's the reporter who talked about Usainu Dabo being ahead uh, in the 2001 presidential elections, wasn't it? Um, this was, um, I think Usainu Dabo testified about this particular one. Oh, okay, um, this was the murder of Ali The Unjai. murder of Ali Unjai, yes. Yes, please yes. go ahead. Tell, yes. us, tell, tell us more about that. Well, um, Madi happened to be on that tour as a reporter, but when they um, arrested people in connection with the killing of Ali Unjai, he was also arrested and charged with murder. Wasn't it, it known that he was just a journalist? It was it attached to the group reporting about their activities. It was known that he was he was he was a journalist um, and, a, and a reporter for that matter with the News and Report magazine. Um, I think eventually the charges against him were dropped. But nonetheless, he was charged with murder. He was charged and prosecuted, and he made a few appearances before the courts. Interesting. And again, Alaji Yorojalo and Baba Gale Jalo. And yes. This, and this time, it, they were questioned about their nationalities. Yes. Can you tell us more about that? That's quite extraordinary. Well, um, I, I, they, I don't know how to explain this, but then it, it, it was quite, we discovered this to be also quite um, commonplace at the time. When they know that they've tried A, B, C, they can't get to you, then they try and, you know, um, cook some, you know, um, some, some other things. And among those things that we were doing was the issue 
of citizenship. I mean, so Baba and Alhaji were particularly victimized for that. And also Uncle Pap Sen was victimized. Even Deda Hydra was also so, victimized. So if you have a last name that is international, that you would find in more than one country, the assumption is you're not Gambian. Yes. Interesting. And again, July 2000, Baba Gale Jalo and Alajimbai. Baba must have been a regular client. <laughs> 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 Your lawyer must have made a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and this time around, uh, uh, what happened? They were released on bail for $25,000, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, and they were taken to the serious crimes unit. Yes. And uh, what was the issue? The issue was about hunger strike at Mile 2 prison. Yes. Interesting. And uh, on 28 February 2001, we have Sali Mbai. Uh, Sali Mbo. Mbo, excuse me. Sali Mbo. Uh, yes, this is the person whose house was searched at 2 a.m. Yes. And police carrying tear gas and everything into his home. Definitely. I mean, when you, when you look at the tactics used by um, our law enforcement agencies, sometimes it's, it's quite, you don't know, like, it's like, they, they, it's like this, these are infiltrated by people. And then, because you couldn't imagine a police officer taking a tear gas to someone's house, a journalist for that matter. But also being searched at 2 a.m. At 2 a.m., yeah. Extraordinary. And uh, Omar Bah and Lamarana Jalo, Babukar Sise and Pamodu Bojang, uh, staff of the Independent and the Daily News, respectively. Uh, this was 13 March 2001. And um, according to your dispatch, they were reporting about demonstrations by taxi drivers over increase in fare vis-a-vis yes. -vis the increase in the prices of fuel. Yes. And they were harassed by the police and their notebooks uh, taken away from them and torn. Yes. And cameras confiscated. Yes. Interesting. 31st March 2001, Al-King Kisanyang and Lamindiba, who were physically assaulted. Yes. Al Kinki in Kiang um, during the by election there, and also Lamin Diba during the by election in Kiang. In, in, in Badibu, yeah, in Badibu. And uh, on 27 June 2001, tell us about that one. That has to do with Aliu Badara Mansare, a Serial Union journalist who was reporting for the Delhi Observer. He was physically al assaulted by the police who arrested and detained him um, yeah, in Bundung. And on 12 July 2001, Omar Ba? Yeah. Omar was also assaulted um, during the co while he was um, covering the trial of um, this man, Landin Sane. Uh, who was a commander of state guards. Yes. Uh, alleged to have committed or plan to commit a coup. That's very really right, yeah. And 18 July 2001? Um, that was um, Alajim Bai, also a reporter for Independent. Um, he published um, a story about um, an ex-APRC um, supporter who said that he was going to expose the atrocities of um, Baba Job, now late. Baba was the um, the majority leader of the National Assembly at some point, and so he yeah. was arrested for suggesting that he was going to publish an article critical of Baba Joe. Yeah, in fact, he interviewed an ex APRC supporter who said he was going to do that. Interesting. 10 August 2001, again, Alajimbai. Yes, he was detained um, by the NIA, who actually arrested him. Um, he reported that there was fraud during the presidential elections. 
because he believed that some people from Kazamas in southern Senegal came into the country to vote for Jame. Interesting. 23rd October 2001, George Christensen, proprietor of Radio One uh, FM. We talked about this one, didn't we? Yes, um, we talked about it. Yes. I mean, it was after the attack that he was arrested and then detained. Of course, they were asking him about who was sponsoring his radio station. His radio station was burnt, and then they arrest him to question him about who was sponsoring his burnt radio station. Yes. That's a good one. Interesting. Uh, and that burning, that arson, was never investigated? Never. There's no report published by the government or anything? No. He received no compensation no. about the burning of his radio station? Nothing. And Alajimbai again? Uh, no, we dealt with, yes, Alajimbai again. And this time around, uh, he wrote a story uh, in West Africa magazine. Yes. That alleged voter fraud. And he was arrested for that one too? Yes. And uh, Demba Samu of the Daily Observer was also arrested in Bansang? Yes. And questioned by the NIA? Yes. We understand that he was the... Um, regional correspondent at the time for the Daily Observer down there. Uh, perhaps allow me to go back to Mbai mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, in his last arrest of 21st November 2001, mm -hmm. uh, the information received suggests that he was not only detained, but he was tortured and subjected to electrical shocks for eight days. Yes, that's very Right. In fact, um, when I was going through my notes this morning, I saw that and I marked it as torture. So it's not part of the incidents of torture that we... That you had listed. So we have to, yeah. That's right. Um, so Ibrahim Masila, BBC correspondent. Yeah, Ibrahim actually reported about the um, some misunderstanding between Gambia and... Um, Bissau Guinea at the time. We know that the relationship between Jame and Kumbayala, who was the president at the time, was not good. Um, to a point that Kumbayala was saying that he was going to wipe off Gambia from the world map. And so Ibrahima was arrested. And July 2002, Guy Patrick Masoloka, uh, that's a Congolese guy who worked for Pan-African News Agency. Uh, that would be number 36 on your list. Yes. And uh, he was, according to your list, arrested mm -hmm. and detained in Comunicado for two weeks. And uh, then uh, 2nd August 2002, 2nd and 3rd August 2002, Usman Dabo and again Alaji Yoro Jalo arrested and detained for a story that alleged a marriage between Vice President and her cousin. That's, that's what is listed here. Yes. And they get arrested for that too? Yes. They got arrested for that and then um, detained, yeah. On, on March 2003, Bai, yes. Reporter of the point. Mm -hmm. And the dispatch says the police, he was arrested by the police uh, for publication alleged accusing the police of taking bribes from illegal money changers. But he was released the same day. Yes, he was released the same day. So he's not of the same ilk with Baba Gale Jalo and, uh, and Alaji Yoro Jalo. <laughs> who made several trips to NIA and the police. Yeah. Okay, so Panderi was arrested and released on the same day. Yes. Was that the reason why he also left? Or I'm not sure. Okay, good. Good. So, Alaji Yorojalo, again, this time uh, he was arrested and interrogated by the NIA officers over a front page story 
uh, alleging that two Gambian football fans had been killed in Karang, Amdalai. Yes. Was the story false? Was he ever prosecuted for that? He was never prosecuted for that. On 23rd June 2003, uh, there was a threat of imprisonment to staff of the independent. Can you tell us about that? Um, this particular incident um, was when the independent published uh, a story about the detention of um, Yankuba Baji, lieutenant, and then um, who was the commander of the military camp in, in Kanelai. Yeah. And the staff were threatened with imprisonment. Yeah. And Abdullah C, editor in chief of the Independent, he was questioned together with Alaji Yoro again mm -hmm. over the article. Uh, 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 so this actually um, um, was the same as the number 41. Um, it was when Salimina came and, and, and told them that he wasn't satisfied with the editorial line of Independent. Yeah. And they got arrested for that? Yeah. Simply because he wasn't satisfied? Yeah. They got arrested for that? Yes. Interesting. And Buya Jame, 9 August 2003? Yeah. Buya was um, assaulted by PIU, PIU officers um, while he was um, at Independent. I think it was outside the premises of, of, of Independent. And uh, Abdullah C, editor-in-chief of the Independent, he was arrested and detained by the NIA in Banjul for three days and was allegedly tortured? Yes. Um. I also, um, um, yeah, I, when I was going through my notes this morning as well, I saw this, and this is not also included in the list of tortures, yeah. It was not included in the list yeah. of tortures. On 2nd October 2003, Lamin Jai of the Independent, yeah, Lamin Jai actually had an interview with Wajwara who um, said in the story that Jame had failed people and that people should take to the streets and as a result of which he was arrested. Juara, of course, was eventually prosecuted and convicted, but they ended up not charging Lamin, but they used him as a witness. Of course, he was a hostile one, but they used him as a witness. Interesting. 2nd February 2004, Abdullah C. again, uh, arrested by police in Bundung and transferred to Serekunda police station. And uh, they were arrested for a story in the in Independent entitled, Who Owns Kairaba Beach Hotel? Can you tell us about that? Y yes. I mean, this was a time when um, information was going around that Jame had bought Kairaba Hotel, Kairaba Beach Hotel. And um, then they ran a story about that. But then it was a question mark because I'm um, so sure they didn't have all their, um, their, all their facts. But then um, they were arrested for it, yeah. And, and in this occasion also he was arrested with Alaji Yorajalo. Alaji Yorajalo, yeah. I, uh, I think he should be given a recognition certificate for <laughs> being the, uh, the journalist who stood up most uh, or being most critical uh, in view of the number of arrests here he's gone through. Uh, I think this is a convenient time to stop. It's, it's uh, time for the lunch, for the first break, and we would continue after the break. We still have about 94 arrests to go through, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, I'm, uh Council, I think the witness, Council and Baba Gale, you all need a 30 minute break <laughs> after this <laughs> item is figured that area. So we will resume in 30 minutes. Meetings adjourned. <laughs> Thank you.
Can you explain that? Help us understand what happened. Well, what happened <coughs> was that the reporters went there. The National Assembly um, was having sessions. It was the, um, the State of the Nation Address, and they went there for coverage, and they found some um, um, NI officers at the gates of the National Assembly. Um, when they identified themselves that they were from independent, they were told that they wouldn't be allowed to enter. Interesting. Uh, 22nd July 2004, Abdullah Isi, again Alaji Yorojalo and Deida Haidara, they, they were taken to the Serious Crimes Unit and questioned in connection uh, with uh, uh, the oil scandal involving the Gambian and Nigerian governments. Was that uh, the Nigerian aid to Gambia, the lifting of crude oil? Yes, that's exactly. They were arrested for that? Yes. And then in April 2004, uh, the independent was attacked? Yes. Uh, and uh, the premises burnt, and uh, the independent staff were forced and locked inside, but they escaped uh, without any fatalities. Correct? That's right. Now, let's talk about Sam Obi, a Nigerian reporter for Radio France International. Yes. Sam Obi was a, or is, is a Nigerian, and he um, used to be the banjil based correspondent for RFI. So when the GPU organized the protest march in, 2000, in 2004, then he gave that story to Radio France. It was a phone-in um, interview um, which he gave, and then he was subsequently arrested and detained as a result of that. And this was in connection with uh, a protest march over the death? The death of Deida. Of Deida Haida. Yes. And uh, Musa Gassama of the Independent? Mumudu Gassama, excuse me, of the Independent? Yes. Tell us about it. Um, he, he was arrested um, and then also assaulted by police at Carnifing Estate. Um, um, and then he was also allegedly subjected to torture. And um, he, according to what we've gathered, he was um, investigating uh, for possible publication um, a story about the closure of MJK Plus Computer Center. And uh, on October 2005, Pa Modu Yeah, so Pa Modu was also um, arrested in Soma. Um, we don't know exactly for what reason, but then what we do know was that when he was arrested, those that arrested him were accusing him of um, destroying the good image of the country through the story, by way of writing the kind of stories that he was writing. On 13 October 2005, the Point newspaper, and uh, there was forceful discontinuation of the newspaper column. Yes, this was Good morning, when. Mr. President. Yes, this was when the um, National Intelligence Agency um, invited um, Uncle Pap Sen to um, go there, and when he went there, they told him. Uh, clearly that they were not going to tolerate any continuation of that particular column that was being run by Deida. So they told him to um, stop that um, column, and then he complied. From what you know, uh, what was this column about? The good morning, Mr. President. The good morning, Mr. President column was created by um, Uncle Deida, from what we learned. And this is where he... Um, almost on a daily basis will criticize or will essentially critique the policies and programs of the government. And of course, he was um, particularly targeting the presidency about what the presidency does or doesn't do. But then um, when you look at the column also, you um, realize that um, a lot, it's also quite diverse because he was also talking about the situation of farmers um, the halt situation in the country and a lot of other um, social issues. Musa Sedikan, the independent, 
Uh, okay, so Musa <coughs> actually um, had traveled to, I think, South Africa, and then um, where he chanced upon the South African president, Tabombeki, at the time, and then he told, talked to him about the issue of the murder of Deida, and then um, from what we learned, Tabon Beki did promise him that at that level, you know, at the level of the African Union, they were going to see what they could do about the murder of Deida. So when he came, he granted an interview to the point uh, where he spoke about his meeting with Tabon Beki, as a result of which he was arrested and detained. Uh, and also, it wasn't limited to that. It also extended to the investigation or possible investigation of the killing of the Ghanaians. Yes, Zambia. yes. The, the, the Ghanaians and, well, let's say the um, 54 or 44, I'm not sure, West Africans, including for some Ghanaians here. And because he talked to Kabombeke about that? Yes, also was, about he that. He was arrested and, and, and interviewed. Yes. And uh, tell us about Ramasurai Chare on uh, 16 December 2005. Well, this was the um, first anniversary of the killing of Deida, and the GPU had planned um, on a protest march to visit the site where Deida was shot and killed. And they were prevented by the personnel from the police intervention unit. And um, so in that process, Ramatulai was taking some pictures of the <laughs> incident, and then he was eventually, um, you know, assaulted, and they seized um, his gadgets. 28 March 2006, Madi Sise of the Independent. Uh, this was a closure of the of the Independent. Yes. And it was carried out by the. PIU, isn't it? Yes, very well. And can you tell us what, uh, what happened in that particular occasion? I think we went through this before. We went through this before. Uh, Mahdi Sise and Musa, and Musa and yes. were yes. arrested and detained for three weeks. Yes. Okay. Ibu Wage? Um, Ibu Wage, this was in March 2006, 29th March to be specific. Um, he was arrested and detained um, for about a week before he was released. Um, he was also not charged, and then, um, well, it also pleases me to announce that Ibu is also in the hall. And Malik Mbup, communication officer for RVTH and former reporter of the Daily Observer. Yeah, so Malik was among the four journalists that were rounded up, um, including Lamin Cham and Pamo Dufal, and also um, Musa Sharif and they were taken to the NIA where they were tortured, to which Lamin Cham was given testimony yesterday. And uh, this was in connection uh, with, with the Freedom newspaper. With the Freedom newspaper. Yes. So it appears Freedom newspaper was also a thorn in the face of Jami. Anybody associated with Freedom newspaper would be arrested and detained or tortured. Very well. Uh, then uh, 24 July 2006, Sam Obi, Abdul Ghaffari, and Oladi Meji, Abdul Ghaffari Oladi Meji, uh, sports editor for the Daily Express. And uh, your dispatch suggests that uh, NIA arrested and detained Sam Obi and Abdul Ghaffari uh, while Suleiman Makalo fled into exile. The journalists were being prosecuted following publication of a press release by civil society organizations condemning the government's blocking of a freedom of expression forum to be held in the Gambia on the sidelines of the African Union Summit. Yes, um, it was in 2006, the Gambia was hosting the AU Summit here in Banjul, and on the sidelines of it, there was a planned meeting which was going to focus on freedom of expression um, which the government didn't like. I think this particular event was scheduled to be held at Combo Beach Hotel, but the government actually um, didn't allow the event to hold. So um, the CSOs released a press release condemning the government for its actions, and the journalists published it, and as a result, they were arrested. 
7 September 2006, Dudu Sane, arrested, detained, and tortured? Yes. Um, we spoke about his case quite at length yesterday. Uh, he is the person who became paralyzed. Yes. His wife, first wife abandoned him. Yes. And this then he later died. The f yeah, this first wife died and then... And the yeah. second wife abandoned him. Yeah. And then he later died. Yeah. Now let's talk about another arrest on 15 June 2009 of Emil Ture, Pamudu Fal, Sarah Tajabi, Pap Sen, Ibrahim Asawane, Sam Sar, Abu Bakar Sedikan. And uh, this was June 2009. This was the GPU's press release in reaction to Jamis' derogatory comments about Deda Haidara, who was murdered five years earlier. They were charged with sedition and, and criminal defamation. Yes. Um, like um, Pamori says, this is a turning point. The, but then what eventually happened was that Jame granted an interview to the GRS. He was being interviewed by uh, Mr. Kebadiba, who is now late. And during the interview, the um, question of data, of course, was asked. And the way he responded to it wasn't, well, I, for the lack of a better word, I would say wasn't nice. And I mean, out of my respect for data, knowing the kind of person he is, I mean, if the commission permits, I wouldn't want to repeat those words. But I mean, they were not nice. And the GPU at the time, under the leadership of Datafa, who, it, if I may announce, is also in the hall. Um, Datafa what? Datafa Sose, um, wrote a press release in response to um, James' remarks. And as a result of that, you know, the GPU leadership and the two newspapers that published that press release, that is The Point and Foray newspaper, um, a total of about seven people were um, arrested and detained, and they include Emil Toure, who was the Secretary General at the time, and Sarata Javi. Sarata was the Vice President, and then Pamodu Fal. Pamodu was the Treasurer of the GPU at the time. At the time, at the point, they arrested um, Uncle Pap Sen, um, who was the proprietor, and they also arrested Ibrahim Sawane. Ibrahim was the news editor at the time. And when they went to Foraya, they arrested Uncle Sam Sar. Sam Sar is the managing editor of Foraya newspaper. But of course, they found Abu Akar Sedikan there when they were effecting the arrest of um, Uncle Sam. And Abu Akar Sedikan was trying to take pictures of, I mean, these people arresting Sam. And they also took him along. And they, um, they, they, they yeah. So that's what happened. And this. Um, Saving journalists, it became um, later known as the six, the case of the six journalists. They were taken to the NIA where they were detained, and then later they were, um, you know, charged and then prosecuted and convicted on charges of sedition and defamation. And they were sentenced to two-year jail terms. Yes, they were Press sentenced to two-year jail term. But and were subsequently pardoned. Yes, after spending 20-something days in, in, in prison, they were given presidential pardon. Of course, the GRS came and they brought GRS, I will put it that way, to, um, for them to you know, apologize to the president, um, um, which all of them, I think, were very careful um, not to do. Of course, they wouldn't say anything that was critical, but then um, they wouldn't also apologize in the way the um, government or the security people wanted them to be. But of course, that was what eventually led to the exile of two people, Buya Jame. Buya was also an executive member, I think a co-opted member of the GPU executive, and then they tougher, because they tried to arrest Buya, said then Buya ran away, and now he's in the US. And then they tougher at the time was in Mali, because they um, of course, as the president of GPU, also had a position at the West African Journalist Association where he was coordinating a sub-regional project. And as a coordinator, his presence was required there. So he spent time in Mali. So while he was there, then, um, of course, they, you know, um, she never came back until now, yeah. 
And uh, this system of apologizing to Jame in exchange for a pardon was basically a modus operandi of the Jame government. As far as you, you, you know, is that the case? Y yes, it happened in a, num in a number of cases. And then even um, in our discussions or sometimes in our professional forums, we do discuss this thing, whether it is appropriate for journalists to um, go um, to those you know, places and you know, broadcast the testimonies of those people the way they usually do. And then we, we talk about how ethical or otherwise it is. And as, as journalists, we know that actually, um, if you can't tell the full story, then um, perhaps you shouldn't be there. And most times, they don't allow you to tell the full story. Now, 22nd June 2009, Augustine Kanja, or Kanjia, uh, from the point, he too was arrested for taking pictures of riot police trying to control a large crowd outside the magistrate's court during the hearing of the case of the six journalists or seven journalists. What yeah. do you say about as, that? As, as you can see, um, the regime is constantly nervous when it comes to the question of who killed Dada. And as a result, a lot of people were victimized merely for that. So these six journalists, their case was first being heard at the magistrate's court in Carnifeng. So Augustine was a reporter for the point, and he was merely at, you know, at the outskirts of the, you know, of the court and taking pictures, actually in the street, literally. Then some PIU officers saw him taking pictures of the crowd and they came and arrested him, and they took him away. Cameras were dangerous equipment during that time for journalists. You take pictures, you get arrested. We've seen quite a few of that happening. Um, 7 January 2013, Abdullahi John. Well, um, this particular incident, I was there with John. Um, this was when you go up to Sibano, there's a road that branches off. It goes towards the um, Dasilame end. Um, so that's where you have the borders between Gambia and Senegal. So um, there were some Senegalese soldiers who were arrested by um, the rebels in Kazamaz, the rebels under the command of Salif Sajo. And Salif wanted to release these rebels. And the negotiation actually happened between Sajo and um, an organization in Italy um, called Sant Isidio. It is um, formed by the um, former foreign minister of Italy. So they did this negotiation, and they wanted to release the soldiers, of course, for political reasons. But they don't want to give it to Senegal, so they wanted an intermediary. So that is how Gambia was invited to come in to receive these soldiers. And of course, I was at the time writing for AFP, and Ablai was writing for AP. So only the two of us were invited as I mean, known government journalists to be there. But the government, was, they were not actually aware of our presence there. So when we reached there, then they saw us, and they started asking questions. And there was this state house photographer, Gassama, I forgot the first name, who started you know, like taunting us, telling us, why are you guys here? Why are you guys here? And then Ablai responded to him. Then Numo Kujabi was the um, NIH chief at the time. He was there, and that was how they bundled, they bundled Ablai, and then they um, whisked him away from that scene. Of course, myself, I was invited by the then Interior Minister Osman Sonko and the Secretary General Njoguba, and was told that I would be allowed to go in into Kazamas, I mean, with the rebels, but then I shouldn't share my story with anyone. But when Ablai came, then Ablai was um, detained at the NIA, and um, yeah, the, um, yeah, Ablai's case is, is, is sad, I mean, yeah. Ablai Kujabi was the then Director General of NIA. Yes. And from that operation, he was detained, yes. arrested and detained. Yes. And you, as journalists, you were invited to attend and witness, but you cannot share the story or the information with anyone. Well, yeah. They told me specifically, in, in fact, the interior minister told me, if you share this story with anyone, I mean, you will have problems, you know. So, 
you didn't you remind them that you were a journalist? Well, at that instant, um, it was a bit tough. So what I did was I complied with them. I wanted my story. I went with them into the bush and then met the rebels, saw the soldiers, and then did whatever we wanted to do. But when we came out eventually, I not only shared my story. In fact, when they wanted to um, write the story in a manner that was not truly, rep truly representative of what happened, I wrote a commentary to, to, to debunk that. What did they say? Well, they said that actually Jame was the one who negotiated that, which was quite not true. It wasn't accurate. So, so they wanted to hijack the glory? Well, yeah. And, and give it to Jame? And, and give it to Jame, yeah. When he played a, a, a minor role De in, def in this whole thing? Definitely, yeah. After there was breakthrough? Yes. He was just there as a recipient? Yeah. In fact, the Santi Isidio official, I was just having lunch with him and I told him, um, because we had some delay and some, I told him that, but why is this happening? And he told me, well, in a very enigmatic way, we don't want to have, we don't necessarily need to have credit for this. And then he stopped there. So it was later that I started interpreting what he meant by that. Maybe the government of the Gambia wanted to take full credit for what happened. So in the end, they had to give in because they were just there as negotiators and what they were most concerned about was the freedom of the Senegalese soldiers. But regardless, you wrote an article debunking the claims by the government. Yeah, they, the GRS uh, published it, um, broadcast it, but it was also, um, it was the same reporter who shared the story with um, Observer and The Point, um, the same story, so I had to write um, a commentary to debunk it. And uh, did they come after you? No. Lucky you. Maybe this time around, your commentary was written, right? Yeah, it was written and published. Uh, would the situation have been different if that was uh, mentioned in the radio? That, oh, President James claimed that he negotiated uh, the deal to release rebels from Kazamas was in fact not true. He merely received them. How do you think that would have been received if this statement was made over radio? It wasn't going to be. I probably, I, I mean, I never believed in luck until I became a journalist. I mean, I knew, I mean, I was just some lucky guy, but it was going to be terrible, very likely. And uh, Mr. Job, uh, is it the same person? The same no, person we Abdul spoke about Abdul yesterday. Like, yes, mm -hmm. Alaji Job mm -hmm. of the Daily Observer. Mm -hmm. um, he too was arrested on 7 February 2013, wasn't he? Yes. Uh, and, and he too was tortured. Yes. And he was kept in custody uh, and tried mm -hmm. for one year, six months. Yes. And he was acquitted on yes. the start of September. Yes. And Pasule Jadama, a freelance photographer? Well, um, th this was at the Banjul, Banjul Magistrate's Court. And... Um, Lamin Babanding Jabate and Pahari Jame, who were Attorney General and Solicitor General respectively, were being tried on allegation of allegations of fraud, I think, if I remember quite well. And then, so this guy was there, a photographer, and he was taking pictures, and then eventually he got arrested. And uh, 1 January 2015, Taranga FM was ordered to stop broadcasting. Yes. And uh, this was the uh, failed coup of 30 December 2014. Correct? Yes. And uh, what happened to them? They were banned, weren't they? Um, well, they were told not to be um, reviewing the newspapers in local languages, also in this instance. And uh, on that same day, police arrested Alaji Abdullahi Sise and detained him in Yundum. Yes, it's happened. And Alaji Abdullahi Sise was the son of the proprietor or the... Uh, the son of the proprietor, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Now, 
fast forward to 17 July 2008, mm -hmm. Abdul Hamid Adiyamo, a Nigerian publisher. Yeah, Adiyamo um, was the um, proprietor of and the, and the editor of today newspaper. And I must say, today also contributed a lot to, because today actually was the first newspaper in the Gambia um, to print colored newspaper. So he also is a very brilliant guy. So on this instance, he um, published an article about children um, not going to school, but going to some dump sites where they will pick some um, scrap metals and then they will go and sell those scrap metals for some food. Um, so that, that's the story that he wrote. And then the problem the authorities had with the story in particular, they said, was the fact that he used the picture of a child. Of course, the child wasn't quite identifiable, but then they said, why would he do that? Um, but we do know that the true motive was that the story kind of, um, you know, um, well, what you can interpret it to mean that the government is not taking, you know, enough steps to take care of children. At the end of the day, he had to pay a fine of hundred thousand dollars. Yes, yes. Just for publishing the image of an unidentifiable child. Yes, he has to pay. Hundred thousand dollars, he fine. Interesting. Uh, let's move on to. So, so um, if I may correct, actually, um, on this instance, I think the case was eventually withdrawn. The hundred thousand dollars, I have to correct that, was pay was he was fined hundred thousand dollars when um, Gumbo Ture was um, facing trial at the magistrate's court in 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 Banjul. Of course, Gumbo made some allegations against Professor Carr. And Adiamo wrote a commentary or a news analysis of the testimony um, um, at, the, at the courts, and then for which he you know, um, was believed to have you know, done some contempt of court. And he was fined to pay 100000 or, or he made a commentary of a matter that was sub -judice, Yes. And on the basis of that, he was charged with contempt on this, on and this fined 100000 Yeah. All right. Contempt can be a serious offense sometimes. Sure. Uh, 28 March 2007, uh, Fatu Jaumane, uh, US-based contributor to uh, allgambian.net, and what happened to her? Well, Fatu um, was a reporter at the Daily Observer before she left for the U.S. And then in 2007, she was coming back um, to, um, because her father, I think, if I remember quite well, passed away. And he was coming to attend, um, you know, those rituals. And upon arrival at the airport, so she was arrested and she was taken away and detained and prosecuted. She was charged with um, um, false news um, because they claim that she wrote an article on oldgambia.net. In this article, he essentially, she essentially was saying that, of course, Jame, um, you know, had failed the Gambians um, on the many promises that he gave them. And as a result, Gambians are living in poverty and Jame was a bundle of terror. Um, so, because of those comments, then um, she was charged with false news. And uh, this particular case is quite um, significant because, you know, um, it was also presided over by the same magistrate who presided over the case of Lamin, um, Lamin Fati. That was Magistrate Bouwajau. In fact, when Fatu was first charged, the case was given to Pahari, but Pahari declined. And of course, at the time we know. When a magistrate declines a case, I mean, it's perhaps because of something, then the matter was given to Buba Jao. Um, Buba had a reputation as the you know, journalist magistrate because any journalist that appears before him, of course, he was going to convict and, and sentence you. Um, even though the lawyer at the time for Fatu Jao made a case that you know, Buba's court didn't have any jurisdiction over this case, Buba refused to let the case go. 
So he presided over it, and then um, he eventually convicted Fatu. Um, of course, it was very serious. And uh, a fine of $250,000 he was imposed. Yes. But uh, we would come back to this later, the laws, the repressive laws. Sure. It appears that the same set of laws were used to prosecute most journalists. Yes. False information defamation, seditious, sedition, and things like that. So sure. we will come back to that later. Now let's move on to Alaji Abdullah Sise, managing director of Teranga FM. He too has suffered quite significantly. Yes, so This it was time, abduction, 2nd mm -hmm. July 2015. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about that? Um, so it was in this instance that he was actually taken away and tortured. So we said abduction because even at the time, that's how we put it in our press release, that he was literally abduct, abducted. Um, because Ablai was going with a friend. I mean, um, when he called someone to meet the person, and all of a sudden, I mean, there was a car that pulled over in front of him, and they just picked him secretly like that, and they denied knowing his whereabouts. And this was the time that he was tortured, and eventually he was prosecuted. And during the trial, he escaped and fled into Senegal, and now, um, yeah. This is the person who made that dramatic escape from RVH? Yes. yes. Now we go back to our own Baba Gale Jalo again, 27 December 1999. Yes, and I, I must say I'm sorry, because what we tried to do was to put this in a... Chronological order. Yeah, but we couldn't. Um, we ended up having some of these things quite late, so we just put it like that. But, um, yeah, so that's what happened with um, um, Baba Gale Jalo. There was a report on the Independent that suggesting that Jame had a new wife in Sintet, and then for which, yeah. People have to be careful about alleging new marriages. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 9 January 2019, uh, Mamadou Salu Jalo or Mamadou S. Jalo, Daily News. Yeah, so he was actually charged with um, f publishing false news because he, there was, every year Jame used to give, um, had package to people, and there was this particular chief who it was alleged had given this package to a woman who he had been sharing some extramarital issues, so um, he was indicted. But then the, ca the case was later dropped. Um, it never went to court. Okay. Well, uh, some of these allegations uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, Presidential hatch package scandal. Chief Balde allegedly bribes lover. Interesting headline. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so um, let's move on to the next 31 March 1995, Pap Sen. I think we had covered this one. Yeah, that because we were talking of, about. Yes, Pap Sen, uh, Ali Ubadara So and uh, Ibrahim Arnest. Yes. This is what led to Mr. Arnest's deportation. deportation yes. To Sierra Leone. Now let's fast forward to April 2006, Lamin Fati. Yes. He was arrested and detained in Comunicado for 60, 63 days and severely tortured and given electric socks. And he was sentenced convicted and uh, fined $50,000 each. Uh, and this was the fine that was paid by the GPU, correct? Yes. Okay, now to Abdul Hamid Adiyamo. Uh, did we deal with this one? No, this uh, is a separate one. This is one. 10 June 2009. Mm -hmm. So this would be his second uh, running in with the law. Definitely. With, with the NIA. Definitely. And on this particular occasion, he made a report about the firing of the Minister of Justice, mm -hmm. Minister uh, of Lands, and the Speaker. Yes. Um, I think he he made an, an error, a, a slight error in the story. But then, that's what happened, because everyone had the same story that Adiamo had. Um, Jamet did fire these people, but I think what happened is in the middle of it, so he changed his mind on some of them. So the other papers were able to get the new development. 
but Adi Amo didn't get it, so he published it and he got into trouble. Sometimes it's like a race between him and the newspapers. If the newspapers beat him to announcing it, he changes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, uh, yeah. And this one, uh, 13 January 2014, Seni Marena, a freelance reporter, and Musa Serif of The Voice. Yes, Seni was actually working at the Standard. So when Standard was shut down, then he started freelance journalism. And then he was selling some of his stories to The Voice newspaper. So on this particular case, there was a meeting by the UDP in, it wasn't a rally, it was just a town hall that they had in the village of Tanje. And during that meeting then, they announced that um, some, 19, um, some 19 EPRC young people had actually um, um, switch sides. Switch sides, yeah, effectively. They joined the UDP, which Seni reported, and as a result of which he was arrested, detained. Musa Sharif was the editor of The Voice, so they both were arrested, detained, prosecuted. Um, luckily for them, they were acquitted and discharged. But the magistrate that actually discharged them, I mean, shortly afterwards, had to run for her life. Who was that magistrate? Um, it was Hakim. I wouldn't get the first name, but um, some um, lady, young, young woman, she probably was in her mid-twenties or so. This time the case didn't go to the journalist magistrate, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, was it Jacqueline? It's Jacqueline, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Saga. Uh, 27 June 2014, Sana Kamara of the Standard, Yes, Sana wrote an article about the um, human trafficking in, in, in the Gambia. And this article was actually from the, you know, United States annually publishes reports on the situation of human trafficking in the world. And Sana got this report and he published it. And it didn't paint a good picture of the Gambia that we kind of feeling in, a, in our responsibility in protecting people against being trafficked. So as a result, he was um, arrested and detained. Sana afterwards had to run. Exile was the answer for Sana, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, 15 September 2013, Fatu Kamara. Um, that would be the proprietress for the Fatu show, isn't it? Yes. Um, and tell us about that one. Well, in the case of Fatou Kamara, what happened was that she was hosting a show on GRTS called the Fatou Show. And also at the same time, she was the director of press and public relations at the office of the president. And she got arrested because it was believed that she shared information with Freedom newspaper. And yeah, she got arrested and she, she was detained. Um, for some time, I think, uh, yeah, she was detained for some time. And at the time, uh, what happened was that the GPU actually approached um, one of the lawyers, um, Sagar Jade, to invoke the Women's Act um, for her to be released. And by the time we actually filed that, she, she was um, already um, granted. Well, while we were filing that, then we received a call that she was being taken to the Virgin Magistrate's court. Then we had to rush there, you know, yeah. Uh, ultimately, she too filed the case against the Jaume government, didn't she? Well, that was the same case with Lamin Fati and Fatu Jaumane. And received compensation. Yeah, received compensation. Um, thank you, thank you very much. But her supposed crime uh, was sharing information with Freedom Newspaper. Yes. Uh, S September 2011, Sekou Sise arrested by the police? Yes. This was because of Nanama's case, because Nanama Keta was the sports editor at the Daily Observer, and he was alleged to have shared some information with Freedom Newspaper. So he, um, as a result of that, he lost his job at, the, at, at Observer. But apart from that, he also um, he wrote a petition to the Office of the President to say that the Daily Observer wrongfully terminated his services and 
as a result of that, he was arrested, detained, and prosecuted. So while that trial was ongoing, um, he applied for bail and was granted bail. So Sekou Sise, who was an executive member of the GPU, came to his rescue and provided him with his documents. So Nanama jumped bail. He fled um, because he couldn't take it. And so Sekou was called, and then he, um, yeah, so he was asked to pay the fine, uh, the, the bail bond of 100,000 dollars, which the GPU paid. For some, exile was the answer. Yes. And uh, Sekou has to now come and pay for guaranteeing the appearance of Namana. Yes. Uh, it, it seems like Freedom Newspaper was the nemesis of Jame outside as the independent was the Jame's problem in the inside. That's right. So Sekou Sise again, reporter for the Foroya newspaper he in 15, on 15 June 2008, arrested and detained at the Kotu police station. Yes. Then he was a reporter for, it's the same Seko Sise. Um, then he was a reporter for the Foreign newspaper. Um, on this instance, it was Dida, Dida Halaki, um, who um, was a dual Ethiopian um, British citizen, but was working in the Gambia and was quite close to the presidency. I think he was the one who replaced Sayatal as the head of, as the managing director of Observer. So Dida Halaki was arrested, um, and then he was detained at Kodu Police Station. So Seku went there to find out about that particular case, and then um, so he took pictures of Dida, and then they, you know, yeah. Again, then they, the camera yeah. is a problem. Yes. You know. So Mafuji Sise in 2015? Mafuji actually, Jame was having um, a political rally in Sukuta. And then Mafuji at the time was with the Voice newspaper. So he went there, and then he was just in the middle of the crowd. He didn't even go to where near the president was. So he was just taking notes and recording. And some, you know, soldiers or military people saw him and then they just came and dragged him um, from the crowd and they kind of rough handled him and they took him behind where the podium was or where the VIP tent was and there they threatened him I mean some of the threats were quite serious that they were going to kill him in fact some of the questions they were asking him was um, where are you working? He told them, I'm working for The Voice. And then they asked, is that an underground newspaper or something like that? You know, yeah. But that's what happened to him. And 2014, Sana Kamara, Daily News? Yeah, so in this instance, what happened was that at the time, the tourism authorities were complaining that a lot of or bombsters, or so, well, so to speak, were causing nuisance around the tourism development area. And there were reports that soldiers were going to the beaches and arresting these young people, beating them, torturing them. And there were claims that some of them were, um, or some of them died as, as a result of that. So Sana and I actually went um, there to to this to this to the to the beach and then we had interviews with um, with some of the um, boys there and they told us a lot of stuff. So when we were coming, then Sana took a picture of someone who um, is from one of these Eastern European countries. I don't know the country exactly, but he was believed to be a pilot for the president. So he said, "Why did we take him a picture?" And then so he started complaining. Then he called the soldiers who came and then. They arrested us and they took us to the um, Senegambe station. We were there until around 8 and then released. Is that the same incident as the 27 June uh, arrest of Sana, uh, which had to do with human trafficking? Oh, it's different. It's different. Yes. And on this second occasion, he was alone and he was arrested and detained at Bundung police station. Yes. Uh, and uh, 
And uh, he also, as a result of that arrest, crossed yeah. the border and went into exile. Yes. Uh, November 10, 2016, Alaji Manka, photojournalist. So this was during the um, presidential nomination and Jame was going to the IC to get his nomination done. And Alaji Manka is a photojournalist and while he was, Jame wasn't even there yet, but while he was taking pictures of the APRC crowd that gathered there, he was arrested and, and taken to the NIA where he was detained. And uh, Jida Halake again, the managing director for the Daily Observer? Yes, Dida, um, so he was arrested because they said he gave um, false information to um, a public officer. I am not sure we know exactly what this false information was about. But I must say, uh, Dida, Dida Halaki was quite an interesting character because when he came um, during the um, 2008 Congress of the GPU, um, where Ndeita Fasose was elected as president, Dida was the one who led the campaign against the GPU um, at the time. Matter of fact, he wrote an article to say that GPU was not um, Gambia Press Union, it was Gambia Political Union. And then immediately after Nde was elected, he uh, also published something on the Observer to say that those that were interested in setting up an alternative body were invited to go there. Eventually, this didn't happen, but what we know was that shortly after all those things, he himself got arrested. And when he got arrested, the first people that he called um, was um, the GPU executive and Swaibu to go to his rescue. And of course, Swaibu also didn't s respond because, in fact, when he wrote that, then Swaibu also wrote back on the news and report to say that if you say that the GPU means Gambia Political Union, your name also Halaki in Maninka means someone who is caused. So they had that kind of, you know, um, human, but then. Yeah, so uh, he's, in, he's, in, he's in the UK now. Indeed. And on 10th November 2016, you know Sali? So it was on the same day that Alaji Manka was also arrested when this nomination process was ongoing. Yunus was reporting for the Daily Observer and he also was taking pictures of the APRC crowd that gathered there. I think what they had problems with more was that Yunus was taking a photo um, of the presidency and the crowd using his mobile phone. So taking pictures was a problem with yep. the mobile phone. Bakari Fati, 9 November 2016. Bakari and um, Mohamed Sabali were arrested together. Bakari Fati was the, um, he still is, the um, uncle at, EP, at, at, at GRPS on agriculture programs. So um, on this particular instance, what happened was that he went to Kanilai, I understand, to record the, uh, an activity by the former first lady, um, an agricultural activity, and then he brought this particular material to GRPS, but it was not played. At the time, Maud Sabali was the managing director. What was eventually played was the nomination of the opposition leader, Mama Kande, because it was the same day that Mama Kande also had his nomination. And by law, Yarris was um, required to broadcast that. So they broadcast that instead of the agricultural activity by the former first lady. And as a result, they were both arrested and detained. And for, but particularly for Bakari, I think he was released only after Jami had left. These people were arrested for doing what the law required them to do. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, there is one we skipped. This should have come earlier. That was the two th June 2001 arrest of Momodu Thomas. Yes. It was in Basse where Momodu Thomas was um, covering the, the national 
youth conference and festival called the NACONF. And then um, in his report, he reported that the organizers of the NACONF didn't provide enough food and sleeping facilities for people yeah. there. And as a result, he was arrested. For saying there was not enough food and enough accommodation. Yes. And for that reason, he was arrested and detained. Yes. April 16, 2009, Moses Nden, Keba Yoromane of City Limits Radio. Moses and Keba used to host a radio program on City Limits Radio, a sports program. So in this instance, they had an argument with the permanent secretary of Ministry of Youth and Sport at the time, Mr. Mamanyik Njai. And as a result, um, they were arrested and detained briefly. You disagree with the permanent secretary, you are arrested. Mm -hmm. okay. 27 June 2011, Alao Ahmad Alota. Yeah, Alota was, um, is also a Nigerian. In fact, he, um, he worked with Deda and he was the one who co-authored alongside Dembajao the, um, the, the autobiography or the biography of Deda called A Living Mirror. He was the one who wrote it, and he later became the executive um, director of the Gambia Press Union. Um, on this instance, they was actually, Native Associates was in exile, also contesting for GPU presidency. And they had to talk to those that were on the ground. And as a president, he was required to give a statement um, during the Congress. And a lot of facilitated that by allowing him to come on Skype um, and talk to people. And as a result of that, he was um, detained, you know, arrested here. Yeah. You talk to Pandarin by you detained. You talk to Nita Faso, say you're also detained. <laughs> right? That's what it seemed like at the time. Correct? Yes. And July 2001, Mardin Jai was also arrested, a journalist? Yes. Could you tell us about that too? So Madi was the, um, so Media Foundation for West Africa is based in Ghana and the GPU is an institutional member of the Media Foundation for West Africa. So what they also do is that they monitor press freedom violations and Madi was regularly sending reports to them on what was happening on the ground. And as a result, he was arrested and forced to open his email, which he did. And Fabakari Sise of the Foroya in 2007? Yeah, so Fabakari was also arrested when he was covering a, a protest by students in 2007. And he too was beaten? He was beaten and they also um, destroyed his press gadgets and took away his notebook. Uh, Uncle Pap Sen again in February 2009. Could you tell us about that one? Yes, Uncle uh, 2009 was quite a tough year for, for, for Uncle Pap, definitely, because um, in this particular case, what happened was that the point reported that um, Mr. Lamin Sanya, that was, um, he's the son of the former director general of GRS, Modu Sanya, and then he was a diplomat. Um, he was working in the foreign service. So the point reported that Lamin Sanya, was being detained at Malto, a Gambian diplomat. And they arrested him and charged him with false publication because the police said that Lamin Sanya was not being detained at Malto. He was being detained at NIA. So that was false. And um, the- Not the fact of the detention was false, but the place of detention. Yes. That's what they said. So the, 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 the order time, um, this one was um, because he, they said he wasn't a Gambian, you know, imagine in 2009. And then so they said that he committed fraud, um, that he obtained a Gambian passport, um, you know, illegally, that he wasn't a Gambian. So uh, Uncle Pap was appearing um, before two courts at the same time. I could remember there was a particular day when he appeared at the Carnifee Magistrates Court 
and at the same time in the afternoon he traveled he had to rush to Banjul to um, appear before another court there these two cases were happening simultaneously at the end of the day he was acquitted yes so then Yaya Damfa yes and 2007 yeah and so Yaya Damfa actually was with um, was on an assignment with some amnesty um, officials uh, Yaya Damfa used to work for for a newspaper he was the one who reported that he had seen Chief Mane at Fatoro Police Station. So yeah, so he was arrested and detained. Um, that brings us to the end of the list of those arrested and detained. We went through 90 incidents, but involving about 140 uh, individuals. Uh, now to wrap it up, uh, let's talk about the exiles before we talk about the repressive laws. Uh, were you able to compile a list of the journalists who had to go on exile? We definitely have to update it because the one we have is not an updated one. Uh, but then we do know that um, the Doha Center for Media Freedoms did conduct a study in 2010 on um, the situation on the plight or the plight of Gambian journalists in exile. And some of the people that worked on that study were Amidjouf Cole, who is now at the CRC in Data Files CRC, also worked on that. And um, Uncle Dembajao also worked on that report. And they discovered that at least 20% of practicing government journalists were living in exile at the time. 20%. That's one-fifth. That's a significant, significant uh, percentage. Of, uh, of, uh, but could you commit to provide a list to the commission? Yes. And, and maybe the findings of, uh, of that study that was carried out, such that the commission would have good information as to the plight of uh, these exilees and, 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 who they are, and who they are. I certainly will provide the list. Thank you. And then uh, to wrap it up, let's talk about the laws. Uh, that affected journalists and, and what, what's the situ situation as it stands. But before the situation as it stands, let's have a quick look at what the situation was, some of the problems that the journalists had to face and the repressive laws that were used to, 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 to muscle journal journalists or the practice of journalism. I recall that in the early part of your testimony, you talk about uh, uh, a colonial ordinance that was used to prevent the um, registration of Gambia Press Union. And uh, later they had the Telegraph Act, was it? Uh, which, which, which was also used to, to prosecute journalists. In fact, uh, Mr. Babu Kargei was charged under the Telegraph Act, something like that. So you talked about problems in the criminal code the Newspaper Registration Act and the Information and Communication Act. So tell us a bit about these, these, these laws um, uh, and how they affect journalists. Well, um, like I said yesterday, a number of these laws were inherited from um, the colonial government. And of course, they were here when um, Jawara was here. What we do know is that the Jawara government didn't um, do so much of amendment of these laws, but nonetheless, they applied them on certain people. And when Jame came, um, he did a lot of amendments on, on, on these laws. So one of the laws, of course, is the Newspaper Registration Act, which was first um, amended by a decree, that is decree 70 and 71 because the um, fee for registration of newspapers at the time was $1,000. So when they came in, um, um, in 1994, then they passed decree number 70 and number 71. So this decree number 70 and 71 increased the bond 
from $1,000 to $50,000. And then eventually, in 2004, then they also amended the criminal code, the Newspaper Registration Act again, and this time they increased the bond from $50,000 to, um, to $500,000. Of course, we do know that this is not in line with um, um, international standards or even Gambia's obligation under international law um, because it kind of like, um, it, it commodifies media. You have to be rich to be able to exercise your right to freedom of expression, which is a fundamental, I mean, human right. And the international law generally frowns upon any kind of registration system that will place unnecessary burden on citizens to be able to exercise their right to freedom of expression. So they increase um, the bond um, in, that, in that manner. But during that particular amendment was also when they um, inserted a provision in the criminal code. Um, this provision is on false publication and broadcasting because the criminal code had what was, called, what was called false news, or probably they were not satisfied with the scope of that, and then they inserted another um, provision to say false publication and broadcasting. And it was also during this period that they increased the, the fine or the penalty in general. I think, um, if I remember quite well, the penalty was about 1,000 or 600, I don't remember quite well, but um, when they came in then, that was when they increased it to a minimum of $50,000, and then they could, you could be fined up to $250,000. And in terms of the jail term, I think it was from six months to two years um, imprisonment. So they kind of like, um, the penalties became more draconian, and the definitions became quite overbroad. So that's what they did with the Newspaper Registration and Broadcasting Act. And um, that's but under but the... But even in terms of uh, the provisions in the criminal code with regards to false publication, uh, they also uh, in increase the punishment with regards to sedition. Yes, they also increase the punishment with regards to sedition also. Um, also, the same, the punishment is the same as the false publication um, and, 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 and from jail terms of six months or a fine of $500 to now a fine of $50,000 minimum and maximum of 250000 and a jail term of a minimum of one year of to both fine and imprisonment. Very so, well. So for a, for a seditious... Uh, offense or publication, one can go to jail at least, say, for at most one year imprisonment and, and a fine of $250,000. Very well, yeah. yeah. So the criminal court has sedition also, and um, it has a number of um, provisions that are not friendly to the exercise and enjoyment of freedom of expression in general. Criminal deformation? Criminal defamation is also there, um, you know, and also the same penalty. Um, it has also been increased during that amendment in 2004. And how about the Information and Communication Act of 2019, amended in 2013? Yes, so the Information and Communication Act was originally passed in 2009. Um, what happened was that they thought that they needed some piece of legislation to guide policy around um, information and communication, uh, infrastructure, and related issues. Um, so in 2013, then the government passed, um, amended the act, and inserted this particular provision. Um, that is to say that if you publish any information on the internet which is false, then you go to jail for either a term of 15 years or you pay a fine of three million, or at the discretion of the court, you can both be fined and jailed. Um, so this is also, I mean, it, it, it's the most obnoxious law um, we have with regards to media and freedom of expression rights, because it's also a strict liability offense. I mean, once you, it's false, it doesn't matter what your intentions are. I mean, you get the penalty.
and because this is publication on the internet, it affected not only those in Gambia, but also those who were not asked. In, in fact, it was mainly targeted at those, because internet by 2013 become, became very influential in the political discourse. And um, a lot of information was being sent out from the Gambia to a lot of publications outside. And mainly, these were done by people who were working in the system and were sitting on some information that were of legitimate public interest. And of course, they will share them. And the regime didn't like that. So that was why they came in, they came with this particular provision. But of course, that time there were a lot of online newspapers dealing with Gambia, but we are not actually based or hosted in Gambia. In fact, all the online papers that were operating during Jamie's time were not based in the Gambia. All of them were operating from outside. Online journalism was quite criminalized. Freedom newspaper? Freedom newspaper was one of them. Jollof newspaper news. was one of them. Gainaco. Echo. Gainaco. Gambia Echo. Gambia. Yeah, so you had a lot of them. So this provision actually targeted mainly those, those, those newspaper, those online newspaper outfits, correct? Well, yes, it targeted those papers, but it also targeted those that are on the ground sharing information with those people. And also, it targeted social media activism by not necessarily journalists, but you had a lot of young people that were coming up at the time, and they were populating Facebook and also some other social uh, media platforms and sharing information there. So it was targeting also those people. So it was quite stifling. It was. Um, thank you very much. Uh, that brings me to the end of my questioning. I now hand over to Mr. Chair for any further questions and a final statement to the Secretary General of the Gambia Press Union. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Chairman Council. And thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary General Yame. Notwithstanding the massive intimidation, harassment that you endured during the 22 years, the resilience shown by the journalists was quite remarkable. Did you operate under some code of conduct in the GPU or some internal self-regulation? Okay, so there is um, a code of conduct for media practitioners in the Gambia. Matter of fact, the last time we review and revise that was in 2016, and then we made sure that this code is widely circulated, and every journalist gets a copy so that it becomes either your Bible or your Quran, because you should principally be guided by um, this code of conduct. Um, in terms of um, the enforcement of the code, um, we um, just recently set up a media council, which is a voluntary um, self-regulatory mechanism that will be there to monitor compliance or otherwise of the code and also professional standards. So um, right now the council is set up and um, all the structures are put in place. They are just trying to um, get um, an executive secretary who will be responsible for the day-to-day -day affairs of the council. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Commissioners, you have any questions? Yeah. Uh, Bishop, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Sehujame, you gave quite an impressive record of what the GPU had managed to do during uh, those years of um, difficulty in this country. Um, as an organization, you did quite well by, you know, engaging the services of lawyers um, for journalists who could not obtain one, and also you managed to pay the fines of journalists who were not able to pay their fines. Now, could you kindly tell me, how did you manage you know, to 
I mean, get all these funds? Well, um, the GPU, um, as a trade union and professional body, is um, um, a membership-based organization. Um, uh, until Jamia left, I think our membership was just around 250 because you had a lot of people who wouldn't want to come and register. Nonetheless, we do not discriminate against anyone in our interventions except that they can't vote and be voted for. Um, but membership subscription alone cannot take the GPU anywhere. So that's why the GPU um, very much um, gets funding um, from a lot of our partners. Um, these are embassies, these are media rights organizations that are concerned about the welfare of journalists in the country. And I must say also some, um, you know, Gambians who um, have some money and they w are very glad to share some um, for humanitarian purposes and they wouldn't want to be named. Um, we, we had instances of, of those. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go from uh, right to left to my Commissioner Carr. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, um, Mr. Jammy. My first question is on access to information for journalists. What were the restrictions that were placed on um, journalists to access relevant information for their work? I must say that the Gambia had never, ever enjoyed any, um, you know, distinct recognition of access to information from a legal point of view, from the 1970 Constitution to the 1997 Constitution. Um, but of course, the way JAMA was operating um, made it even more difficult because journalists were um, denied access to pu public, info public officials, um, whether it is those that are holding public information or even public offices or even public documents. I mean, these were materials that um, journalists were actually denied access to. I can in fact say that throughout the time that Jami was there at the presidency, the only time that some journalists were allowed to even access State House and to report from there was when Fado Kamara was appointed the director of press and public relations. And of course, she had to do a lot of convincing of the president for him to allow the private press to cover um, the State House. But even then, it was very limited as to where you can go, what you can ask, and what you cannot ask. So generally, Gambians, um, particularly journalists, don't have access to information. In fact, um, I, at some point, I don't even think Gambians believed in the ordinary decency of sitting and discussing with journalists because our relationship with members of the public was characterized by fear and paranoia. You find one or two or three people sitting down and discussing, and once you identify yourself as a journalist or they know you to be a journalist, and all of them will start shifting and say, oh no, let's keep quiet, there's a journalist here before we all get into trouble. So it was that difficult. I do know that now, of course, we have to commend the president um, because um, President Barrow, when he came, has started changing that narrative. Jame used to say that journalists are bad people we are enemies of the people, we are enemies of development, and now that narrative is changing. And journalists, for us to be the legitimate representative of the people, our relationship with them must be defined by truth and honesty and trust. The second question is, um, with, from what you have said, with all these repressive media laws, it would be natural for people to be very careful about how they go about their journalistic work. Uh, what was the level of self-censorship, if it existed at all, within the community, within the journalism community, and how did that affect the work of journalists? There was a high degree of censorship and self-censorship. Uh, matter of fact, every journalist who was operating in the country at the time, you had to at some point switch on what we call your survival mode. Final question, and you can just include this in your closing remarks. Um, I would like to have uh, your views on um, reform of, of the media as an institution, and I'd be very grateful if you can focus on welfare, the welfare of journalists particularly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. If you can come to that, uh, uh, 
at the end of the, the remarks. That would be great. Commissioner Kinte, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Sehu. You, you made uh, perfect uh, deliberations over the period, the two days. Um, you have just mentioned that uh, even the local community are critical about journalists. Uh, my suggestion is uh, journalists, uh, the GPU in particular, uh, must go out to consolidate the gains they have got through this new regime in the new Gambia. That now there is, a, to a large point, uh, freedom of expression, and uh, you are gaining more tr trust and respect from the communities. Is it not possible that you institute some sort of a law or proposal that uh, uh, each paper has a column which will go out to regularly remind journalists of their roles and functions, which will also go out to enlighten the community about the importance of journalism, uh, and so on. That's, that's one point I, I, I have. The other is, uh, since now that uh, the CRC is on, on uh, what has GPU done to ensure uh, that uh, uh, they have been given enough room, adequate, uh, I will underline, adequate room for uh, credible and competent performance? Um, I am not sure I fully understand the first question. Um, if you could kindly... Yeah, let me come back. Yes. Um, we have agricultural column in many papers. There is a column on women and marriage or whatever, regular in some papers. Is it not possible that GPU, either by virtue of understanding with, other, uh, with the uh, media house, different media houses, that a column on journalism it seems that uh, there is a need for people to increase awareness on the importance and the role of journalists, one. Also, it is going to help to regulate because it will con constantly remind journalists of their roles, uh, 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 the ethical need for their performance, and so on. I haven't seen columns on journalism uh, as, uh, as such. That's what I'm suggesting. I said whether GPU has that in their, mind, in their plans to make so there is broader awareness and trust and confidence on journalism. Yes, so to that particular question, I, you know, so the thing is, I think um, journalism, journalism is a, is, a, is a craft, just like, you know, in some ways it's a craft, just like carpentry and metalwork. And usually what we say of these people is that they oftentimes focus on you know, making good beds for other people and not for themselves. So journalists hardly look inward to kind of, but I, I agree it's very important that we do a lot of programs around media literacy across the country. And um, we have rolled out some programs. We, um, even when Jamie was here, we um, had a lot of sensitization programs with the security. And that changed a lot of um, things. We had a lot of sensitization with the civil society people, yeah. with government. And this coming Thursday, we are going to have um, a program with um, the Bar Association and the judiciary, um, you know, so that we could kind of improve the relationship between the legal fraternity and the media fraternity as well. In terms of the CRC, when they came, we also paid a courtesy visit to them. And then we submitted a, a position paper to the CRC. In fact, a 42-page position paper that we submitted to the CRC, um, proposing, I mean, some you know broad and generous protection for not only freedom of expression but for the journalism um, as a profession. Because when you look at the 1970 Constitution, it recognizes in, you know um, press freedom as a fundamental human right. And in fact, it gives the media the role of holding the government accountable to the people and also to promote the objectives of the Constitution. So that is there. But what is so far unstated and untested is whether um, we um, as a journalist, have a right to do the activities that we do. 
without any interference by anyone. So these are some of the proposals that we gave to the CRC. Thank you very much, um, uh, Commissioner Jones. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, Deputy Chair, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, CEO, for a very exhaustive testimony. I have got three short ones. One is in relation to Dr. Dudusani. You talked about his wife, but you did not talk about his children. Did he leave a family behind? Yes, I'm sorry about that. Actually, he um, has five children. Um, all of them are there. Yeah. We'll get back to that because it's critical yes. for us to know thank about you. Yeah, issues. Thank you. I forgot to mention that. Yeah. yeah. Now, the other one is in the area of women. In this long list, I only got two women's names, that's Sarata and Eromatulai. Uh, were there any other women, or were these the only two women who were arrested and detained during this period? That we have in our records so far, yes. Just to, <laughs> just to add on to that, we have Fatu Jaumane and Fatu Kamara added yes. to the list. Yes, yes. Yes. yes, thank you for... Right. Thank yeah. you. And, yeah. of course, Nde Itafa also, having been harassed and sure. in exile. But sure. Yeah. Five women, yes, so five. to speak. Now, the last one is uh, more technical. In addition to your reaching out or taking cases to the ECOWAS Community Court and to reaching out to the AU, did the GPU as a body... Uh, reach out to other international human rights organizations either in the way of uh, lobbying or submitting reports or shadow reports whatever it is that is that is good if you have those reports it would be helpful to know yes we in 2010 we made a submission to the universal periodic review of the united nations human rights council and in 2014 also we made a submission, and this year the Gambia is due um, for um, you know hearings at the at the UPR in October, and then we made a submission again. So this will be a third time that we are making such submissions at the UPR, besides the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, and also the ECOWAS Court of Justice, and even the Supreme Court of the Gambia. We did um, file some cases there. That's good. Uh, thank you very much. Any more questions on the left-hand side? No? Is it, uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Jama, if you have any closing remarks to make, please proceed. Well, I, I think in my, in, my, in my closing, I might want to come from um, an unlikely corner that is um, particularly the, 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 the issue of Children. I mean, um, I, I have been following the TRC, TRRC through and through, and one of the um, things or testimonies that te testimonies that were coming out was about the fact that some of the people that were uh, the leaders of these atrocities, of these very heinous crimes, um, had a very difficult childhood upbringing, and of course, for someone like me that reminds me that as a society, what kind of environment have we created for our children to grow up, I mean, in a very comfortable uh, manner. And um, in, in, for the Commission's work, I think it will be very important. We explored it as well so that we promote issues of social protection, particularly for children. Because when you look at what happened in the Gambia, in the case of Jame, you look at what happened elsewhere from Congo, um, to Libya, where you had the Gaddafis, you had the Mobutus, um, even to, as far as to Russia, I mean, where you had the Stalins, you know that these are all people who had a very difficult childhood upbringing. So if you don't take care of children at this point, at some point they come back to haunt society. I, I, I was recently doing 
some work with a colleague of mine. And one of the information that I needed was the um, number of um, orphans that we have in the country. And we know that this is a huge problem in the Gambia right now. But nationally, there is no statistics to show the number of orphans that we have in the country. And we know that for religious reasons, for social reasons, women are giving birth, and then some of them are dumping their children. But who is accounting for I mean, these children? I, I think um, in a broader perspective, the commission should particularly look into that. And then when coming back to the media, of course, what I would want us to look at is for everyone in the Gambia to not see an attack on journalists in isolation. Because the journalists are not enemies of the people. The journalists are friends of the people. The people who are enemies of the people are those that seek to supplant our freedom with fear. There is no question about that. And when an attack is made on a journalist, know that this is an attack that is aimed at curtailing the rights and freedoms of every individual in society. Because press freedom became the first casualty of the Jami regime. And we all know what, has, what that resulted into. I mean, we are talking about the human rights violations. We are talking about the looting of our money. We are talking about underdevelopment of the country. All this were there because the media has failed or was supposed to fail in its responsibility to hold the government to account. And those was, that was because the media was gagged and the people were sitting comfortably looking at how journalists were being arrested, killed, and you know, tortured. And I think every person in the Gambia should see that journalists are our representatives. I mean, for me, let me take an example of me. When I started this practice, I was always happy to go to bed hungry, knowing that perhaps I talked to a woman who was struggling to put food on the table for the kids, or maybe a woman whose house got burnt and got some money from elsewhere, even though I was going to bed hungry. Because that's the social contract we have with the people. So I, people should see us as legitimate representatives of, um, of, 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 of theirs. And for the commission, we believe in this process. And we submit ourselves entirely to this process. Because so much had happened with very little answers, so many terrible things, with no justice at all. And all these years, we were looking for answers. We were looking for justice. We were looking for truth. We couldn't find it anywhere. So that's why we submit ourselves wholly to this commission, in the hope that the commission will get to the bottom of the truth of what happened um, in cases where crimes were committed against journalists. So that is essentially our submission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, everyone, here. Thank you, thank you very much indeed, um, uh, especially those very wise words on uh, how we um, raise our children in our society. Uh, what you have um, uh, uh, referred to as a universal phenomenon, the individuals that you recall uh, indeed a difficult um, uh, uh, childhood or uh, things that they had gone through. But thank you again very much for coming to testify before us. Sorry we kept you in that uh, chair for a long time and uh, the things that you had to go through, uh, extraordinary memory you have about that. Thank you again so much for coming. Uh, we will, uh, Council, we have um, a witness um, ready for the afternoon. Yes, after the lunch break. You're wonderful. Thank you so much. So we will um, uh, uh, take a lunch break, one hour, come back at half past two sharp. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>